The phone, it's a pleasure to welcome to the program Virginia Eubanks. She's an associate professor of political science at the University of Albany, SUNY, and the author of, among other books, uh, Automating Inequality, How High-Tech Tools Profile Police and Punish the Poor. Uh, Virginia, welcome to the program. Sam, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Now, uh, your first chapter is uh, From Poor House to Database. Just will you remind people, just because you're using it as uh, as an important metaphor, I think here, uh, what, 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 what is a poor house? Yeah, so it's amazing because we, we all kind of know what a poor house is because it shows up in our language, right? Like, oh, you kids are going to send me to the poor house. Or it shows up on our roads, right? There's still roads in many communities called like Poor Farm Road or Poor House Road. But we also kind of don't know what they are. So it's this really interesting sort of cultural phenomenon, I think, of the way we, 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 the way we think about poor houses. And I use the digital poor house as sort of a metaphor in the book because I think the tools that I'm looking at in public assistance are really sort of more evolution than revolution. And I really wanted to put the tools in context. And that context ends up going way, way, way back in our history, like as far back as 1819, if not earlier. And basically what was happening in 1819 is this huge economic um, depression, this economic dislocation and economic elites did what they do when this happens. And they had, they sort of put out a bunch of studies and the question they were asking in the studies was like, what's the problem really? Is it poverty that is sort of lack of access to resources or is it pauperism, which meant at the time uh, sort of that you would ask for help when you were struggling, struggling economically. And not surprisingly for a bunch of studies that came out of Harvard and Yale, <laughs> the studies all came back saying, you know, the real problem is not poverty, it's pauperism. It's the fact that people are asking for support. And so they invented at the time sort of a solution for that problem, which was to create this system of county poorhouses, which were brick and mortar institutions that basically incarcerated poor people as a condition for receiving help. So in order to enter the poorhouse, if you had the right at the time, you had to give up your right to vote and hold office. You couldn't marry. You were separated from your children who were then sort of farmed out as free labor for as, as domestics and agricultural laborers. And also the death rates at some of these institutions were really um, astronomical, like 30% a year. Um, so the, that distinction that poor houses created the sort of deep social programming I think we invented at that time is this idea that the first thing our public services should do is make distinctions between the sort of deserving and the undeserving poor. Um, and that is why I use that metaphor to place these new tools in sort of that history, that what they do is the same thing that county poorhouses were doing in 1819, which is raise barriers to receiving help so high that nobody but the absolute most desperate people will ask. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I have to admit, like, you know, like I, I, I was exactly one of those people who would use, you know, sort of new poorhouse. I was in the, the, the concept, but I had no idea um, uh, until reading your book about the, you know, where I start to uh, that that notion of poorhouses being basically reformatories. And um, we definitely hear the um, it, the echoes of that. Just rhetorically, uh, I, I can't help but think of Paul Ryan and uh, mm -hmm. sort of like his story about the the kid who would rather have a, a lunch rather than, you know, a brown bag lunch rather than free lunch at school. Like there, there is some type of moral righteousness to um, not being poor, essentially. Right. Um, yeah. and, or to asking for help. Or, yeah. And asking for help is, uh, you know, is, uh, is a sign of some lack of, of, uh, of moral righteousness or righteousness period. And, and so um, the, the argument you're making is that, um, we no longer have uh, these the these poorhouses, but that um, technology. In, I guess you tell me if I'm wrong about this. Is is uh, creating is in some way sort of allowing us to reconstruct the poorhouse without it being so clear that's what we're doing. Right. Yeah. So uh, I'd say that 
what we're really doing is building, so I talk about it in the book, as a digital poorhouse um, with these sort of new statistical models, with artificial intelligence, with machine learning, algorithmic decision making, specifically in public service programs. So I look at um, uh, cash assistance and, and supplemental nutritional assistance or food stamps. I look at um, homeless services um, in unhoused communities. And I look at uh, child protective services as well, that we're building these sort of invisible institutions that contain people, like physically in space, that um, profile their future behavior, um, and that uh, police and surveil their sort of everyday lives. And I think that's very similar to what the poorhouse did in 1819. So yeah, I do think we're starting to sort of recreate those systems, but in um, a, a much harder to see way, which is I think one of the things that makes these new tools so dangerous. Yeah, and I, and I want to return to that sort of a, a, a broad critique, but first let's um, uh, let let's go through the examples that you you use. Um, you start in Indiana. Uh, and uh, like you mentioned, you are uh, you, you basically recount the introduction uh, of a a new system that uh, essentially governs these various benefits that uh, folks living in poverty um, get from um, uh, via the Indiana uh, state government. And and you look at and before you get into the details, I mean specifically, I want to talk maybe about the the, the Stipes family and and you also. Um, uh, a woman, uh, Omega Young, but um, you 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 made a decision to sort of enter into these processes, sort of from the the customer base, rather than sort of looking at it. The perspective is from the the customer base, if you will, as opposed to sort of like the managerial uh, perspective. Yeah, so I think it's really important, particularly just in the last sort of year or two. There's been some really incredible work that's come out that is sort of taking a second look at um, technological systems like machine learning, like artificial intelligence. Like we're in the middle of like a critical re-examination. I think it's really important, this moment. But one of the things that was frustrating to me about those conversations is that we so rarely heard from the people who are most impacted by these systems. So I think of it as, you know, we usually hear from designers, we often hear from policymakers sometimes users in the sense of like frontline caseworkers who use the systems, but we pretty much never hear from people who see themselves as targets of these systems. And I think it's just really crucial to hear their voices, both in terms of understanding their experience and understanding their sort of analysis of what's happening, because I find they have a lot less to lose in sort of playing nice around these arguments, and they have some really compelling analyses of, of like what's happening in the world. And one of the stories I tell um, at the beginning of the book is actually about some work I did in this area a long time ago now, 20 plus years ago now. So it was probably 2000, um, and I was sitting in a tech lab that I had helped build with a community of women who lived in a basically a single room occupancy hotel. And I was sort of shooting the breeze with one of the women who had worked on the project with me, and we were talking about technology, and I was uh, asking her about her electronic benefits transfer card, her EBT card, which is the sort of debit-like card you get public assistance benefits on now. And they were new at the time, and so I was asking her about them. And she said, oh, yeah, you know, it's good in some ways. It's a little bit more convenient. Maybe there's less stigma at the grocery store. But also, my caseworker uses the sort of digital record of my purchases that it produces to track all of my movements and question all of my spending. And I must have had this like crazy, shocked, naive look on my face because she just like pointed at me and laughed for like two solid minutes. And then she got really serious and she was like, oh, Virginia, you guys should be paying attention to what's happening to us because they're coming for you next. And I really feel like that analysis is really spot on and like 15 years before anyone else had it. So I think there's really important reasons morally to pay attention to what the experiences are of people who are most affected by these tools. But I also just think if we want to be smart about what's going to happen in the future around these tools, we need to be looking in these communities that are seen as sort of where it's okay to experiment. Exactly. Right. And, and, um, uh, it's fascinating because I I have a system with my daughter where I give her allowance on a like a debit card, and mm. uh, I see wherever she spends. I get. A, I was about I get to say, notice. do you track her spending? Of and, course you do. <laughs> and I try to tell her like, here, just 
let me give you some cash too, so that you right. just have this ability to go and, you know, I don't know, go to uh, Starbucks and uh, buy a coffee without me knowing it or something to that effect. Um, and this is it's becoming uh, ubiquitous, I think, um, in many respects. But all right, let's so let's go into this uh, the story of of Indiana. Um, there is a one point four billion dollar contract uh, with with high tech companies and and and. Uh, there, there seems to be like sort of like competing narratives going on here with this that are both like they do this because this is a way, you know, there, there's the, the sort of the classic story of like, oh, the way we're going to deal with our school is to build more stuff because I'm friends with the guy who owns the cement company uh, in town. And also there is this is a way where we can we can impose our biases in our we, we can make political decisions that don't look like political decisions yeah i think that's exactly right it's one of the things that happens when we look at these tech systems it's not that the tech systems uh you know that their nested their politics are necessarily better or worse than the current politics we have it really depends on the system i think one of the real dangers is they pretend they're like stories pretending they're not stories or so it's politics pretending it's not politics like oh this is just like an administrative change it's just a little tweak it's more objective it doesn't it's we're not making policy but the reality is these are political decision making machines and i'll give you an example from indiana so in indiana in 2006 then governor mitch daniels um contracted with IBM and ACS and a number of other companies to um, what they called, what they said at the time was a modernization of the public assistance eligibility programs in the state of Indiana, um, meaning how you applied for and were judged eligible or not eligible for public services like cash benefits or food stamps. Um, and the system that they built, one of the sort of understandings that got built into the system was that if you at any point um, failed to give the system information it needed to make a determination in your case, then that was a failure to, um, uh, to, to basically cooperate in establishing your eligibility for the program, which could then be used as a way to kick you off the program. Because there's this really old rule on the books that basically was there if somebody who was applying just like refused to come to meetings over and over or, or, you know, was just being so difficult that you had to deny them. They basically built that rule into any kind of failure in the system was um, understood as this intentional failure to cooperate with establishing eligibility in the program, which was enough reason to deny you services. So, for example, Omega Young um, was an African-American mother of two grown sons, um, she was on Medicaid. Um, she had, after the new system had been brought online, they moved from one-on-one -on -one meetings with caseworkers in person to meetings that were scheduled through sort of a telephone scheduling system and that you uh, then received a call from a call center, from a worker in a call center to do your eligibility or your recertification interview. So she was unable to make the time they picked for her. She called her county office to say, hey, I can't make that time. Um, they somehow didn't get that message. Uh, they called her at the, or the call center called her at the set time. She wasn't there. She wasn't there to get the call. And so they checked the box that said failure to cooperate in establishing eligibility. And they denied her all of the benefits that she was already on. So Medicaid, food stamps, free transportation to medical appointments, um, and, and which put her in incredible jeopardy because the reason she missed the appointment was she was in the hospital with terminal ovarian cancer. So she was denied all the benefits that were supporting her while she was sick. She actually died on March 1st, 2009. Um, two days later, there was a hearing on um, the denial of her benefits because she did actually appeal that decision. There was a hearing and they um, recognized that it was their mistake and returned all of her benefits two days after she died. And. and and so this is the, you know, the, I guess the, the, in the alternate universe, the older universe, she's meeting with a caseworker. She has a, uh, a direct relationship with them. They understand that she's in the hospital. The, this is not a time we would schedule it for. 
I would never cut this person off, the caseworker would, would, would react theoretically. You would hope so, right? Yeah. And certainly discre- frontline discretion in casework has historically been a place where racial discrimination has entered the system and also discrimination against single parents or people who are sexual minorities or migrants, like lots of places for human uh, bias to enter the system. Um, The reality, though, of the system in Indiana is that it denied one million applications in the first three years of this um, experiment, which was more than a 50 percent increase from the three years before the experiment. So um, uh, that it basically, rather than shifting the way public assistance works, it just sped up sort of the worst parts of the um, system, which uh, resulted in just incredible human suffering for these families. And, and, and to what extent, I mean, when we look at something like this, this seems to me to be, um, and, and certainly, you know, I, I have some familiar with Pence as governor in, in Indiana. This seems to be like mission accomplished, right? Like we were able yeah. to privatize uh, this funding uh, by, by paying these tech uh, firms and we were able to call our Medicaid roles. I, it's block grant. Uh, I would assume that they're, they're working on a block grant and we were able to call our Medicaid roles and we can divert those funds uh, where we want, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Like this is w- mission accomplished. Yeah, so I often say when I talk about the book that I don't know what was in Mitch Daniels' heart when he made the decision to sign this contract. Um, So I can't speak directly to his intentions. Um, But uh, one of the folks I interviewed for the book, this Medicaid attorney in Bloomington, uh, I think put it really well. He said, look, if we had a system that had been built to deny people on purpose, it wouldn't have worked any better than the system that we got. And so at a certain point, intentions don't really matter. What matters is the impact on people. And that's why it's sort of as the cases in the book develop, the, the sort of intention gets much murkier um, is because I wanted to step people through this process of recognizing, like, it's not necessarily that their politicians are, you know, misusing technology. It's that this deep social programming in the technology keeps reemerging in a way, no matter what your intentions are. And that acts, that forces us to ask some really tough questions. And, and what ultimately, I mean, what, what ultimately happened with the program? Well, there's is good sort of good news in this case, which is uh, the people of Indiana like sort of found out what was happening and just wouldn't stand for it. And so there was basically a big movement in the state of Indiana that came out of a series of uh, town hall meetings where people who were affected came together to talk about their stories. They pushed back on um, the governor. Uh, He was forced to cancel this 10-year contract three years into the contract. Um, And in many ways, the people of Indiana won. The sort of afterward is a bit sad, though, which is um, after um, the governor broke the contract, IBM turned around and sued the state for breach of contract. Um, And in the first several rounds through the courts actually won. Um, They finally worked it out. Um, the, that the damages went in the way of the state, but it, it wasn't much as a, a maybe $100 million um, coming back to the state. They, they you know, spent half a billion dollars to deny a million people benefits in the long run. Unbelievable. Um, all right, well, so let's move to uh, Los Angeles, uh, where, you, um, where you look at the, the question of housing. Where, where does the... Uh, where, where does the automation, where does the algorithm uh, come in here? Yes, yeah, so the system I studied in L.A. Uh, is a system called the Coordinated Entry System. And it's not just happening in Los Angeles. It's actually sort of standard practice just about everywhere in the United States and increasingly abroad as well. Um, but it was really interesting to look at it in, in L.A. because Los Angeles County has one of the highest unhoused populations in the country. I think it's something like, uh, at the last point in time count, it's close to 60,000 people um, who are unhoused in Los Angeles County, and something like 75% of them are completely unsheltered, meaning they have no access to emergency shelter. They're just living in tents or cars or under bridges. Um, so it's an extraordinary human- humanitarian crisis, the housing crisis in L.A., um, and I looked at that system, so it's known by its proponents as um, the Match.com of homeless services. 
and the intention is quite good. Um, the intention is to, um, because there are so many unhoused people in LA and so few resources, um, it, the, attempt, the uh, intention is to risk rate um, all of the unhoused people in terms of their vulnerability to some of the worst outcomes of being homeless, and those are pretty severe, There's death and medical issues and mental health crises and community violence, all kinds of horrible things that can happen to you when you're unhoused. Um, and then to match folks based on their vulnerability score with a uh, the most appropriate available housing resource um, that is out there for them. And so it's actually serving some people very, very well. Um, so people really close to the very top of the scale basically weren't served well by the system before because they are hard to work with. Um, and so most of the time, um, they wouldn't get resources that um, caseworkers might say for slightly easier to deal with um, clients. Um, people at the bottom of the scale, the least vulnerable, are actually doing pretty well because they're being matched with very time and resource limited resources like what, what's known as rapid rehousing. But the reality is something like 30,000 people in the middle um, have been surveyed by this very intrusive instrument um, that they use to vulnerability rank people and aren't seeing any resources at all come out of it. And I really wanted to talk to them about what their experience is. So I talked to a guy named um, Gary Boatwright, and he goes by the nickname Uncle Gary in Skid Row in L.A., um, and he said he was really concerned, for example, with like where his information was going because this survey they have to fill out, ask questions like, uh, are you currently trading sex for drugs or money? Um, are you thinking about hurting yourself or someone else? Is there someone out there who thinks you know they, that you owe them money? Are there open warrants on you? And then they ask if they can take a picture, and then they ask where you can be found at different times of the day. And Uncle Gary told me, hey, it's, it feels like I'm being asked to incriminate myself in exchange for a slightly higher lottery number for housing. And it's actually, a real, again, a really good analysis because it turns out that the database that they keep this information in, it's called the Homeless Management Information Service um, System, sorry, uh, HMIS, um, under federal data law um, can be accessed with no warrant based only on an oral request by law enforcement. So there's some real issues about where this data goes, who it's shared with, and whether or not the people who are giving up their data really have a choice in whether it's really voluntary. They sign an informed consent form, but the reality is um, this is pretty much the only way to get into housing in Los Angeles County. So everyone's going to say yes, even if they're not comfortable with sharing such intensely personal information about themselves. And this is uh, another example of essentially the policing, right? I mean that. Uh, I mean, I think um, uh, we're we're basically talking about policing without police. Yeah, so that's definitely how many of the unhoused people I talked to felt about it. Um, I mean, there were definitely folks I talked to who were like, "This was a gift from God. I'm so glad it happened because they got housed, and that's a really big deal." But a lot of the folks who had gone through the survey. Um, and had participated in the system and had received no resources at all, started to sit back and sort of think, like, wait, what are they using this for, really? Um, and I think it's a, it's a really legitimate question to ask about the system. There's no reason that law enforcement should have access to that information. No reason except for if you want to police unhoused people, if you want to be able to arrest and incarcerated unhoused people. And... and, and and are we seeing that? I mean, uh, in this program, maybe not in L.A., but in other uh, uh, municipalities where they're using it? Yeah, so coordinated entry is actually pretty common um, uh, across the country. It is a fairly easy fix, though. Like, we could fix the federal data um, rules that say that law enforcement can access the homeless management information system. We could fix that tomorrow. We could just be like, no, you can't. <laughs> but do, but like, do we know, but do we know it, that, it, that there are uh, police departments that are accessing it and using it as a way of dealing with their, you know, dealing with their homelessness problem? So currently, uh, I only know about Los Angeles, but currently um, LAPD says they do not um, themselves access data in HMIS, um, but they are legally allowed to walk into a social service center and ask caseworkers for information out of the system. Caseworkers are not required to give it to them, and I think that's really important. 
but they are allowed to give it to them, and many of them do. And so I would say they are accessing um, the system when they are um, looking at uh, criminal justice cases or looking at, at looking to make an arrest. They'd absolutely go into homeless shelters and ask for information out of HMIS. And we should say that this is, we can see what's happening with, let's say, ICE in many respects, what the implications of this are. And when, uh, you know, President Trump says, oh, we're going to move into California, and he seems to have dropped this idea for the time being, uh, but we're going to do something about the homelessness there. Yeah. That, that would be the mechanism they would use. Yeah, I think. So I think, actually, I'm so glad you brought that up, because I think when we have this conversation about intention, one of the things that's really important is to understand that these systems will work no matter what the intention is. So the best example, I think, is actually the DACA database, the Deferred Action on Childhood right. Arrival database, right? So under an Obama administration, the idea was to collect names of people to protect them from deportation. Um, but when the administration changed, all of a sudden, there is a database of 800,000 yeah. undocumented people that is, are in the hands of an executive with a very different idea about what to do with that information. And so one of the things that I think a lot about when I think about solutions is having kind of a um, what Dana Boyd would call like a hacker mindset, which is like, think first, how do I break the system? Not like how is it going to work if everybody's like holding hands and singing Kumbaya and all have the same idea about what's best, but like how do I use this against its intention? And if you can do that, like don't do it. Like how do we harden these systems against uses that even the designers would find deplorable? Because right. once it's out there, it's out there. Right. What, what do you do if Donald Trump is running it? Essentially, exactly. I mean, that's basically. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, lastly, let's talk about the just uh, briefly the Allegheny County. Um, uh, you, you, you went to Allegheny County in Pennsylvania and um, there's a system that uh, flags for potential uh, ne neglect, uh, abuse of, of children. Um, what what was problematic about that system? Well, so the system's called the Allegheny Family Screening Tool, um, and it's supposed to be able to predict which children might be victims of abuse or neglect in the future. And I think everybody would agree, actually, that's a really important question. <laughs> and so it really felt like the stakes of this were incredibly high, um, both in terms of protecting children and in terms of keeping families intact and healthy. Um, so this is a system that is built on top of a data warehouse that the county built back in 1999 that collects information from like 29 different county and state programs. So like adult and juvenile probation, the housing authority, drug and alcohol services, the police department, office of mental health, bunch of, a bunch of other things, school districts, for example. Um, and then on top of that data, they hired a team of economists and computer scientists from New Zealand and, 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 some, and also the U.S. to design a system that could red flag who they think are the most vulnerable, the most, um, the riskiest families in terms of potential uh, future abuse or neglect. The problem, though, is, so it basically comes up on like a thermometer, sort of green on the bottom and red on the top. And if your score is in the red, if it's high enough on a 0 to 20 scale, um, they actually um, uh, automatically open an investigation on your family so that it refers your family for, for investigation unless it's overridden by a supervisor. Um, the problem, though, is that it doesn't actually model child maltreatment um, because we have actually very limited data on children who are um, actually physically, emotionally, or sexually abused. Um, what it does, um, and not enough information to basically build a viable model, so it uses proxies, um, which basically just means sort of a stand-in for actual um, neglect or abuse. And uh, originally, one of the proxies it used was called call re-referral. And basically, all that means is a call has been placed on a child to sort of a hotline, um, it's screened out by their call screeners as not sort of crucial enough to step in um, or as not actually abuse and neglect. And then there's a second call placed to, on the same child within two years. Um, and that seems reasonable, except um, that it's really um, open information in most poor working class neighborhoods, most neighborhoods that are affected by child protective services, um, that um, vendetta calling happens a lot. 
So like a neighbor has a party and you're pissed, you call Child Protective Services. You're breaking up with somebody and it's not going well, you call Child Protective Services. Like sometimes children call Child um, Protective Services on their parents to like exert some control in their in their family. Divorce, so, I would imagine, too. Is also- divorce all the time, absolutely. Um, and so the fact that they thought this might be an appropriate a stand-in for abuse or neglect actually occurring is actually incredibly troubling because it says that these data scientists and economists actually don't know a lot about the system that they're trying to model, so they're modeling the wrong things. Um, and that gets um, – so those choices are made invisible when all call screeners are seeing is this thermometer that says, oh, 17 out of 20. Right. Like it's out of your hands. We're just opening an investigation. Like that doesn't show up. So again, it's a way that we like, we hide these actually political decisions behind the sort of math washed facade of like clean objective numbers. And um, the, the, the lack of, of sort of like ongoing contact, right. That would, that would make these, it's true. It's really the lack of discretion in the, in these contexts, or is it, I mean, so, so just to broaden out the, 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 the discussion as we, we start to wrap up here a little bit, the, the, it seems there's like a, a multitude of problems with these things that range from the assumptions that people make at the beginning that are both political and just sort of, um, I guess, maybe detached right i mean like there's, there's a quality to that that allegheny system which is sort of indicative of like maybe some elements of education reform where it's mm. you know we're doing this based on data and we don't have any real world educational experience and so we just uh, you know i guess apply a um a, a metrics that don't really have anything to do with this i mean so there's there's multiple different levels it seems to me that this can go wrong is how do we how do you fix it or, or can yeah. you <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, is it, is it possible to, to rely on technology to do these things without it uh, obscuring the problems? Yeah. So I think one of the big points that I want people to take away from the book is that we often sort of talk about these systems as um, disruptors or as equalizers even, right? Like this is evidence-based policymaking. This is, le- this is more objective. This is removing human discretion. Um, but in the cases that I look at in public services, the reality is they act much more like intensifiers or amplifiers of the systems we already have in place. And so changing the way these technologies operate is not as easy as, um, uh, you know, having better intentions at the beginning or even, you know, training computer engineers to understand more about sort of social inequality. But it's going to require really deep cultural and political change. Um, But in the meantime, we need to create systems that do less harm or we need to give people the ability, people in communities to give the ability um, to have the ability to say no to things that don't fit their community values. Um, so it feels like rather than trying to go the route of taking all of our values out of these technologies, which just means you're building them for the status quo, the, what we need to do is actually build them with our values front and center. Um, unfortunately, right now, by default, we're building these systems with only values like efficiency and cost savings. Um, but we should be building them from the point of view of equity and justice and fairness and human dignity and self-determination. So you get a really different system if you design from the principle that public services actually should be a floor under everyone. That is a human rights approach that says no one is allowed to you know, ha- have their family broken up because a parent couldn't afford a child's medication or like allow someone like Gary Boatwright to live in a tent on the street in Los Angeles for two decades. At any point, we can say that's unacceptable. But the reality is these tools just reproduce this idea of the moral thermometer, right? They just say, we're, gonna, um, we're, we're coming at this from a triage approach, which says there's not enough resources for everyone. We have to decide who really deserves them. When in reality, the most complicated math is what activist Sherry Honkala calls the belly button algorithm, which is like, who deserves housing? 
Do you have a belly button? Then you deserve housing. Right. Do you deserve food? Do you have a belly button? Right. So the reality is, I believe we're using these systems as a kind of empathy override, right? They allow us to think the most horrifying situations are getting corrected, but everybody else maybe kind of deserves it. And maybe they should go to jail or maybe they should lose their kids. And the reality is no one should go to jail for being poor and no one should lose their kids for being poor. And that's the, that's the basic assumption we have to make when we build programs or these digital tools. I mean, I guess these, uh, these tools, uh, uh, they both function to um, obscure uh, the the values that are inputted into them, but they also, I guess, uh, your book helps put them in stark relief, um, and certainly is an argument, uh, like you say, for for the for, for for something like the belly button rule, uh, where yeah. um, maybe we don't need a process to determine who is um, eligible for this. Maybe we should just provide enough that making that process obsolete uh, on some level, so that. Uh, everybody's eligible and we just put our resources into that. Yeah. I think we all deserve better. That's why I wrote the book. Uh, it's a fascinating piece of work. Virginia Eubanks, the book is automating inequality, how high tech profile police and punish the poor. We will um, put a link to that at majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for the conversation.